Oh, where the red light is? Look straight down the lens, yeah. yeah. What's the first thing you think of when I say the name Anthony Albanese? Unknown, untested and untried. Hmm. I'd, I'd say neutral. A nice guy. I feel that he genuinely will believe in what he, he speaks about. He's very vanilla, if I could use that term. He's nasally. He talks through his nose. That's the first thing I hear when he opens his mouth. In the next few months, Anthony Albanese will face the voters in what will be the biggest test of his political life. Yet even now, many feel they don't know who he is. I think he doesn't get much press. I've definitely seen news coverage of Scott Morrison, but in Anthony Albanese, it's kind of blank. He's a solid bloke. Um, he doesn't have charisma. Um, perhaps I'm a person who likes charisma in our prime ministers. I feel like I'm in a club. A few dozen battleground seats across the country are key to deciding if Anthony Albanese or Scott Morrison will be the next prime minister. <laughs> Four Corners has spoken to undecided voters from some of these electorates to gauge what they think about the two men vying to lead the nation. Last week, it was Scott Morrison. This week, it's Anthony Albanese. What would you say Anthony Albanese stands for? Getting elected. Is he leadership material? Haven't seen that yet. He's almost. He's almost prime ministerial material. Yeah, I'd like to think so, but oh, I've got a huge reservation about it, so I'm very much on the fence on that one. And the pundits weigh in on Anthony Albanese's challenge. This is a question as old as politics itself in Australia. Can Labor be trusted to manage the budget? Can Labor be trusted to manage the economy? I think he had to go from Albo to Anthony Albanese, opposition leader, would be prime minister. And to do that, uh, you, you have to, you know, change your persona a little bit, but you don't want to lose your real, you know, authenticity as a leader. The people who've criticised them for having a small target approach are Labor supporters. They're the people who would naturally be inclined, who want a braver Labor Party and a braver leader. What is the first thing you remember about Anthony Albanese in his public life? Uh, just, uh, I think he comes from Marrickville, so in the suburbs of, uh, of Sydney, and I think he tries uh, to get around as much as he can. I think he's got a uh, big battle ahead coming into the, the federal election. I actually don't have a strong recollection one, one way or another, uh, apart from him becoming the leader of the party. It's my uh, privilege now to formally declare Anthony leader of uh, the Parliamentary Labor Party. Anthony Albanese was elected unopposed as Labor leader after the party's bruising defeat in 2019. Thank you very much and thank you for the incredible honour. It was a shock because everybody expected in the Labor Party to win the election. Bill Shorten expected to be Prime Minister. Anthony Albanese would have been a mid-level minister in a shortened plebiscite government. Well, of course, that didn't happen. And all those who dreamed of the Labor leadership one day, Tanya Plebiscic, Chris Bowen, Jim Chalmers, they were caught flat-footed and were not prepared and ready to run for the leadership because they were expecting to be ministers within days. Yeah. I pay tribute to Bill and to Tanya. Anthony Albanese was ready and he seized that opportunity and he claimed the leadership. It is time. I think when I first heard that Anthony Albanese had taken over as leader, I think my first opinion was scratching my head going, really, is he the best they've got? 
as the person elected. I wouldn't have expected him to be leader of the opposition. He doesn't come across as, well, he's not a suit type of man, but that's probably a good thing because, again, he wants to appeal to the general public that not everybody walks around in suits and, you know, works in, um, works in corporate offices. With the support of the caucus and the party... I've always seen him as a good assistant to whomever is the leader of the Labor Party. I don't think he was necessarily their top choice, certainly not their first choice, but in the absence of Bill Shorten, um, given his election result, there was no other viable candidate. To Scott Morrison, I say congratulations. He came into prominence only after the debacle of the last elections, and then there was no, no other leader who was capable enough to take over. So I suppose then he was a default choice. Despite Albanese's 23 years in Parliament, few outside the party knew much about him. I'm honoured and very proud to be elected the 21st leader of the Australian Labor Party. I know his name has always appeared in Parliament over the years, but I never really followed what he actually did because there are other politicians there in the party that, that sort of took precedence over what he did. And what do you know about him personally? Absolutely nothing. Um, really, I don't... I, I'm assuming like, he's married, I don't, he has children. I really don't know. So it's not something... Now, that's not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we, don't, we don't choose politicians on the basis of their families. In China, which is my background, we don't really talk about opposition leaders and that sort of thing. So this concept is still relatively new to me, and that's why I'm not very knowledgeable about it. I want to reiterate my congratulations to Scott Morrison on his election as Prime Minister. I say to him that I will hold his government to account strongly, forcefully. I am a values politician. What values do you think Anthony Albanese has? I'm struggling with that one straight away. I'm really struggling. Um, uh, per perhaps, perhaps family values is something that stands out for me uh, without knowing in depth. That, that's how he strikes me as a person, family values. To those who have mentored me over the years. <sighs> I've no idea. That's a good thing to come out with. I'm a values politician, but you've got to have something to back it up. Um, and I don't know that he's even actually displayed what those values that he talks about are. I guess the, that he does actually stand for the values of the Labor Party um, in terms of the, the supporting the issues that confront working people. So I think that's, that's where... He, I do think that's where his values come from. Um, and that's probably why he was elected leader of the the party as well, because he does actually reflect those sorts of grassroots views that the Labor Party have about um, the, the, the lives of working men and women in Australia. The Honourable Member for Grangler. Anthony Albanese spelt out his values when he was first elected to Parliament in 1996. First, I would like to thank my mother, Mary Ann Albanese, who raised me under very difficult economic circumstances. She instilled in me a strong sense of social justice and fairness. I grew up in public housing in the inner city of Sydney as the son of a pensioner. I remember... His values are based on, of course, his upbringing. <laughs> and Anthony will say uh, he was brought up to believe in three things, the Catholic Church, the South Sydney Rabbitohs and the Australian Labor Party. And I think that's a pretty good summary um, based on the many, many years I've known Anthony. So they are very solid, um, basic, working-class type values and derived from his experience of growing up with a mother who had a chronic illness, a single mother in um, you know, public housing. So I feel that he would be very the sort of person that would be not trying to divide people. He would want everyone to be, you know, this is, this is you, this is you, this is you. Together, this is us. So I think he'd be, he'd be very much into that. I mean, I know he's very... Uh, have noticed that he's definitely a passionate passionate man. You can see that by the way he speaks. What he's trying to do, he's trying to connect more with the Australian person. The average Joe Blow down in the street, um, 
and, okay, what are your issues? What do you want to see? Anthony Albanese has worked hard to project a public image as a regular bloke, the kind you'd have a beer with. A die-hard South Sydney Rabbitohs fan who DJs in pubs and is fanatical about music. G'day, I'm Anthony Albanese and tonight I'm the guest programmer on Rage. Coming up is Nirvana, who I got to see what was then this uh, obscure band, but there was a real buzz about them at the first ever Big Day Out. Despite his best efforts, Anthony Albanese has struggled to raise his profile outside his own seat. Well, it's interesting. I think he probably thinks he was better known than he actually was. Like his DJing, which started out really as a bit of a joke and a bit of a novelty because he'd had a reputation for being into music and because some of those old photographs of him as a teenage heartthrob had, um, had been floating around, put around by him, uh, ultimately. He's made a bit of an attempt to make himself as a bit of a man of the people. He's got a beer named after him. You know, he presented rage. Um, and he often talks about, you know, his, his sort of origin story, if you like, about, you know, being brought up. Does that ring a bell with you? Uh, no. He's got what after him? Oh, he has a beer named after him as well. Oh, has he? Oh, you know that? All right, that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, look, I like that. I'm not aware of any of that. But look, as far as persona goes, I appreciate he tries, and, and maybe this is completely genuine to, to align himself with working class people. But as I say, I, from, from certainly what I know about the labor movement, both in the UK and here, that's a common alignment that, they, that the, the leaders try and align themselves with working class people. Anthony Albanese came up through the hard left faction of the ALP, rising to become Assistant Secretary of New South Wales Labor by the age of 26. To say no to privatisation in 1990 is to be written off by some in the right as, as a romantic, to be marginalised as a utopian. What's more... Well, Anthony Albanese, uh, in his youth, when he was in his 20s, I think really, you know, was something of a firebrand, you know, a lot of bravado and, and a fighter, as he still is. But in those days, it was probably more in the, in, in the tradition of, a, you know, of the 1960s-style sort of political campaigner and fighter. There's a fascinating photograph of Anthony Albanese meeting Bob Hawke as Prime Minister in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Anthony Albanese has a surly look on his face. He looks unhappy because he didn't come to praise Bob Hawke, he came to trash Bob Hawke. He was there to criticise Bob Hawke for many of the Hawke government policies, argued that it had betrayed Labor tradition, and the totemic issue for Anthony Albanese was the abolition of free university education and the introduction of the HECS scheme. Today he uses that photo to demonstrate that he is leading the party in fidelity to Bob Hawke. He's leading the party in the Hawke tradition. But of course at the time Bob Hawke was Prime Minister, he was one of Bob Hawke's strongest critics inside the Labor Party. He was a raging lefty, no doubt about that. That was, um, you know, for years uh, he spent his, his life when he wasn't fighting Tories, as he says, uh, fighting uh, the right wing of the New South Wales Labor Party. So um, it, it has been an amazing transformation. Mind you, if you'd stayed the same person at 50 that you were at 20, you could, um, you know, have a few problems. But as leader, um, he's had no choice but to move himself and to move the Labor Party closer to the centre. I think he had to go from Albo uh, to Anthony Albanese, opposition leader and would-be uh, Prime Minister. And to do that, uh, you, you have to, you know, 
change your persona a little bit, but you don't want to lose your real, you know, authenticity as a, as a leader. <laughs> Do you think he is an authentic leader? Yes. Yeah, I think Anthony Albanese is an authentic leader, yes. I think he's more in touch with the Australian public than, than Scott Morrison. Authentic means he seems to be presentable, like he's approachable. He goes into the community, speaks to the people that way. So that way he tries to connect with the people on the ground. I think he's a bit more down to earth. Um, I think he's a little bit more approachable um, from what I hear. He's more, he's more like you and me, you know, he's not up on a pedestal, not yet anyway. Sorry, um, Albanese. Anthony Albanese has been a power broker inside the Labor Party for decades. He was a reluctant participant in the vicious Rudd-Gillard leadership battles. I rang the Prime Minister this morning and had a lengthy conversation with her. I informed the Prime Minister that I would be voting for Kevin Rudd in Monday's ballot. Albanese was clearly shattered by the spectacle of the Labor Party at war with itself. I have devoted... Uh, my life to advancing the cause of Labor. I have despaired in recent days as I have watched Labor's legacy in government be devalued. You've been very emotional here today. What sort of personal toll has this taken on you? Well, this is tough. Um, I, uh, I like fighting Tories. That's what I do. That's what I do. Thank you. He is very, very emotional about the Labor Party. He has imbued and imbibed its history, its tradition, its conventions, its leaders, the great triumphs, the despairs. And so he felt very emotionally when Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard were tearing each other apart and destroying the government that he was a part of. That was really genuine. That was the real Anthony Albanese. Uh, and so those tears, which we often see, uh, show a compassionate and very soft side to him, which is often offset uh, by a very, very tough persona. Look, I think he's a very caring kind of person. I feel that he, he genuinely will believe in what he he speaks about so he doesn't he isn't just going to get up and say we're going to do this just because i feel that he he believes in that i think he's definitely a caring character cutting through as opposition leader is a difficult enough task but made almost impossible with the focus on the government during such an extraordinary period of national disasters <laughs> Satirical website The Batuta Advocate dubbed Albanese the Camperdown Frown. We call him the Camperdown Frown because he gets in uh, as leader of the Labor Party and then he basically is met with these bushfires where all he can really do is go and hand out up and goes to fireys and not go to Hawaii. Yeah. And then we've got the pandemic where all he can really do is back the government on as much as he can. And so he was just reluctantly following Morrison. So it was just the, he was frowning while he was agreeing, and it was uh, the camper down frown. There you go. Labor's very pleased that last night the parliament passed the JobKeeper package. Uh, this was the government's uh, uh, package, but it was a package urged by Labor. I'd say that the Queensland upper house was getting more press than Alba during the pandemic, which, you know, is, is to be expected, you know, as, as the Prime Minister said, we were on a war footing. And I, I don't know if you know who the, the opposition leader was during the Second World War, but no, I don't think anyone does, you know.
For much of this year, he's been the invisible man, sidelined by the pandemic, as we were all swept up by waves of crisis. Anthony Albanese still wants to be the Prime Minister, but time might be running out for him to make his mark. We've been talking about the sort of issues whereby people haven't wanted uh, to see distinction and, and, and attacks uh, against the government. People have wanted the government to succeed because we've been in a pandemic. So the political debate has been very different this year. Do you think you've sort of disappeared from people's minds? It, it's been a challenge. I got this. Jesus. I got this. As an opposition leader, it's very hard to have much input into that except to point out failings by the Prime Minister in the management of COVID, which he's done very effectively. I mean, when Anthony Albanese has been his most effective, it's when he's been saying, you know, you had two jobs. You, know, you didn't get the, uh, the, the vaccine in time, you didn't get the right vaccine, and then you didn't take uh, enough urgent action to roll it out. We know that when uh, COVID is absolutely dominating um, you know, the, the, the political and social agenda of the country, starting to roll out other policies at that point is probably useless because it won't even make the six o'clock or seven o'clock news bulletins. That's the problem that he's had. Throughout this pandemic, Labor has been constructive. We put forward constructive ideas for vaccines. We continue. We continue to put forward constructive ideas about quarantine facilities. We put forward constructive ideas about wage subsidies, including, of course, what led to JobKeeper. I really liked his efforts from you know, early times, February and March of, of 2020, and moving through, he seemed to throw all his weight behind um, the government and what the government, both federally and, uh, and on a state and territory basis, were trying to do, which was very impressive. How can you criticise a government when this the society will never be the same as it was two years ago, um, because that makes you look stupid, basically, if you do that. I think being a opposition leader, he is asking the right questions, opposing the government, and keeping the trying to keep the government on their toes. But I suppose their own, uh, I mean, whatever their own policies are, or if they want to win the next election, what they should be manifesting more, I think, I think that's a bit of lacking. Following a post-election review, Labor under Anthony Albanese has ditched the signature tax reforms that voters rejected in 2019. We will maintain existing regimes for negative gearing and capital gains tax. These decisions have left some voters asking why. Thank you. What's happened? Why? So in the lead up to the last election, you're talking about these sort of things, negative gearing and all these sort of things, which put the fear of God into a, into a lot of people, particularly investors. Um, but what's changed? The, they've changed their policy, but they haven't told us why. Um, and if there is, you know, it's got to be more than, well, that didn't work last time, so we're going to try this. What is it, Mr Albanese, that you, that you really believe in? What is it that you want to do as a leader to take us forward? And why is it OK for a couple of years ago that you have these policies, but now you're not running with them? What's changed? I think it's just a play and safe option that they've chosen to do to, to try and create less controversy and uh, as, their, as their option to try and gain power, just, just playing it safe, that's the way I see it. And what does that make you think about Anthony Albanese? Uh, look, I think it's a cop out, you know, sometimes you've got to deal with these issues, you know. Look, I think that if you've, you, you have a policy, you stand by it, but I guess it, it depends on who came up with those policies, like were they a Bill Shorten thing or were they a... Yeah, so if they, you know, if they were something that another leader had, I think if he doesn't stand for those, then he has every right, I feel, to, to change it, as long as he has his own policies and he stands up for them. The fundamental problem was really too many policies that then needed to be funded. 
Uh, so that gave birth to various tax changes, the franking credits, um, uh, negative gearing policy family trusts. So it was so big that it became frightening uh, for people. Well, Anthony Albanese has followed uh, the recommendations of the review, which is to have a handful uh, of signature policies uh, about telling a story about a better future, uh, a more secure future. Um, so he's been doing, he's doing that. We have National Cabinet where... The dumping of unpopular policies without a big new agenda has seen Albanese accused of taking a small target approach to winning government. Well, we, we, we announced our tax policy when we announced them. And the people who've criticised them for having a small target approach are Labor supporters. They're the people who would naturally be inclined, who want a braver Labor Party and a braver leader. So they've, in a sense, made a pretty brutal choice and said, we hope that in the end those people who are complaining will still vote for us because they don't want to vote for the other mob. And what we need to do is focus on the people who are wavering, who might have voted for Scott Morrison and the Coalition last time, but who are ready to think about doing something different and they don't want to provide them with anything that might scare them off. But, of course, that leaves open the big question as to what do you actually believe in? Are you distinguishable enough from the government? Um, and can you capture the imagination of voters uh, enough for them to turf out the government and elect the opposition? And that is a big question mark. Every time I look around our caucus room... Small target approach, it's a little bit annoying because you want to... For me, I want to be... I want to know def definitively of, OK, what are you standing for? Where are you moving forward? What do you want to do? Australia needs leaders. Look, it's, it's kind of like sliding under the radar, really, isn't it? I think that if he wants to make any roads, he has to stand up and say, this is what I'm doing. I don't understand what their agenda is, what they are going to do after if they win. It wasn't the summer many had hoped for, especially the government. So what, what are their policies? What is their forward path? How they want to do? How they want to pull up the country going forward? Good morning. So if they don't come out in black and white towards normal people, it's very difficult to comprehend that. Why can't you make a promise before the election like last time? We can make lots of promises before the election, David, but we can't make all of them on Insiders Today. So do you feel that you know who Anthony Albanese is and what he stands for? I, no, I don't, and I certainly... Um, I'm, I'm crying out to hear that. I, I would like to know. What do you think he needs to do to improve that? Oh, well, certainly I think he needs to come up with um, some, some really good policies that put himself out there. And I, I appreciate that that's a risk and, and maybe that's why there's the reticence to do it. But, um, you know, be firm and come out with some policies and be a great leader, you know? Good leaders lead from the front and carry everybody else with them. And, and I feel like he's got the potential to do that, but we just need to see more and hear more. Do you trust him? Well, you can't trust someone that you don't know. Well, he needs to come up with very precise, clear policies instead of just saying that the Liberal government's policies are not right or that there's something wrong with them. He needs to have a reason for saying that. He, might, he needs to basically present something better to the Australian public. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you Prime Minister Scott Morrison is making the economy a dominant election issue. As he looks to exploit any concerns that might linger about Labor's credentials. Australia's economic recovery has to be secured by people who have a track record in economic management. Otherwise, you're going to see petrol prices go up, you're going to see electricity prices go up, um, you're going to see interest rates go up more than they would need to otherwise. And that's why economic management is so important now as we come out of COVID. This is a question as old as politics itself in Australia. Can Labor be trusted to manage the budget? Can Labor be trusted to manage the economy? Now, voters had made a judgment in the past that Gough Whitlam 
Bob Hawke and Kevin Rudd could do that? Have they made the judgment that Anthony Albanese can be trusted with the nation's finances and management of the economy? He's not yet there. The polls show that voters still believe that Scott Morrison can handle the economy and the budget better than Anthony Albanese. So this remains a big question for Labor. How confident are you that Labor can be trusted to manage the Australian economy? It would be on par with uh, the Liberals as well, the Coalition. I think that when they were in power, they didn't stuff it up or as much as they were demonised to be. Yeah, they didn't botch it during the GFC and that was a Labor policy. And so when faced with um, pressures and um, in the face of adversary, they were able to perform. So I'm not going to wipe them off, even though traditionally it's the coalition that are more fiscally responsible. Look, that's the age-old question, and going back historically, um, that's always where things have gone wrong. They, they've had fantastic ideas, great initiatives, but never really found a way to pay for it. And so, at the end of their term, there's always been a huge, huge deficit, which I, obviously we've got one now because of COVID-19. But, um, yeah, that, that will be interesting to see how that plays out, but if you look at history, it's never gone well. So you basically don't trust them? No, I don't. I don't trust them at all. Well, that's always been one of the furfies across the decades. It's always what the Liberal Party trot out. That's their bag of tricks. Look, I think they'll do... They'll do a good job, like any new government that could come in or that it's either re-elected or that, that comes in. I can't see any government completely destroying the economy. Anthony Albanese has released some major policies. Notably, a pledge to remove the cap on the annual childcare subsidy to encourage parents back into the workforce. I might need help to get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> we are happy, we are happy, we are happy to see you here. <laughs> Valerie? That's a lovely note. Do you know there's a fantastic song? A far more difficult policy area is climate change. Labor's 2019 climate policies were blamed for alienating voters in Queensland, where it won just six of a possible 30 seats. It is indeed uh, fantastic uh, to be here uh, in Cairns for the first full day of my Better Future for Queensland visit. Morrison will say something that isn't true, and then he'll blame someone else. Well, the pathway for Labor back to government goes through Queensland. I mean, Labor holds hardly any seats in Queensland, yet there are many, many seats to win there. But the problem for Labor is that those constituencies are very, very different to the Labor heartland seats in New South Wales and Victoria. So Labor has recognised the need to win seats in the resource states, so Western Australia as well as Queensland, but much of its agenda uh, uh, runs against the interests of those communities and they're very, very sceptical about Labor. Yeah, so it's sort of a tussle in that they want to be environmentally minded, but at the same time, a lot of those people that are working in the mines and things like that are typically Labor voters. So how do you appease both? Now, in December, just last month, I announced our Powering the Nation plan, a plan that will protect our environment by cutting emissions by 43% by 2030, whilst creating 604,000 jobs, whilst protecting existing uh, industries, but growing new industries as well. Labor's 43% emissions target is a compromise, seeking the middle ground between supporters of stronger action and workers who fear for their livelihoods. I think they are very risk averse in the lead up to this election. They did not want to do anything that was leaving even a crack of light for the coalition to exploit. Scott Morrison is extremely good at beating an opponent, you know, at finding something to exploit. And so that has made them, um, some have said, overly cautious about their policy positions and not brave. 
What's your opinion of Labor's climate policy based on what you have seen? Well, it sounds decent and I think it's sort of a stab at um, Scott Morrison's um, client, uh, stance sorry, coming off the COP26 summit. So I don't know the specifics, but I do recall Australia couldn't pledge to reduce emissions as much as it, they were expected to. And I think that's where Anthony Albanese has found an angle of attack to, to make, make something out of it. Oh, look, it's better than the, the, the coalition's policy, but I still, it's nowhere near strong enough. I mean, you look at other areas in the world and we're so far behind. It, honestly, it makes me embarrassed to be Australian when I look at uh, the, the two um, main parties and what, what their proposals are. It's, it's poor. It's really poor. How is it much different to Liberals' climate change policy? They all have a target or that they say they have a target, they might be going about it different ways, but as long as they've got a target um, and they're working towards it, I don't think it really matters how they go about it, as long as it's, again, not detrimental to the Australian people. How are you going to go about it, though? What's it going to cost Australians? Those are the questions that need to be answered. If they've got the answers, they really need to, you know, air it out. The Labor Party faithful are counting on Anthony Albanese to finally deliver them government after almost nine years in the wilderness. I listened to Australians about what kind of future they wanted. A better future for everyone. He's restyled himself and started to sharpen his pitch. In 2022, Australians can vote to go forward under a Labor government with ambition, with vision, and with a plan for economic recovery that draws on our country's values, creating opportunity, rewarding hard work, holding no one back, leaving no one behind. According to the polls, the strategy appears to be paying off. With Labor consistently ahead and Anthony Albanese gaining traction among voters as the alternative Prime Minister. I do see him as somebody that is coming a little bit more out of the shadows now and is, you know, starting to be visible, uh, which is opportunistic timing, I guess, given that the federal election's coming up and Scott Morrison's under fire. So, like, it's just a natural time for him to be sticking his head out. I'm learning more as time goes by, but he's not got very much time left. I know that the um, election hasn't actually been announced yet, so if he wants to win votes, he's going to have to really do more than what he's doing now to really get warm to the people. Do you think he's Prime Minister material? Yeah, I'd like to think so, but oh, I've got a huge reservation about it, so I'm very much on the fence on that one. He's almost... He's almost Prime Ministerial material. I don't necessarily yet see him. I can't, personally, can't see him as the Prime Minister because I'm not sure that he specifically has the, I wouldn't say the skills because he has to have the skills, otherwise they wouldn't have put him there in the first place. But it, it feels like as a leader, he might still be a little bit, mm, what do I do next? Hard to say, is he leadership material? Haven't seen that yet. So for him to be a statesman as well and to put Australia first, I haven't seen enough of him to make that judgment. Yeah, I do think he is, um, even though um, I've, I, you know, I've said he's a bit vanilla, he's a solid bloke. Um, he doesn't have charisma. 
Um, perhaps I'm a person who likes charisma in our prime ministers, um, but I, I think he would do a, um, a solid job. And perhaps in this particular point of time, we need a solid person. We, we need someone who, um, you know, he doesn't flag wave or chest beat. This is what we've become used to from the opposition. The election hasn't even been called, but the campaign is already well underway with vitriolic attacks from both sides. They have learnt nothing from their Anthony fight. Albanese has capitalised on a horror couple of weeks for the government. Ring the bells for four minutes. During which five MPs crossed the floor on key legislation and a cabinet leak put the Prime Minister under increased pressure. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Well, this is not a government, this is a shambles. A rabble defined by division, disunity, and dishonesty. And that's not the problem. With the government in turmoil, it's ramped up its attacks on the contender. And the biggest risk to the economic recovery is the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Labor Party. Somebody who has never held a Treasury portfolio, Mr Speaker. When it comes to the issue of national security, I'm not aware of anyone less prepared, maybe apart from Mark Latham, than this man, Mr Speaker. The leader of the opposition wants to have a character context with me, Mr Speaker. Bring it on. The one-time invisible man is now firmly in the government's sights. Thanks very much, John. Well, thanks very much, Shane. There you go. Over the next few months, voters are finally set to find out what Anthony Albanese is really made of. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jason. Thanks very much, Meryl. I'm Anthony. If he was in front of you right now, what would you say to Anthony Albanese about what he needs to do to win your vote? When are you ready to go? He needs to come up with policy that aligns with what I believe to be necessary for Australia to move forward. He needs to get that out there. He needs a really strong marketing team behind him to get out there and put the hivies on, kiss the babies, do all the things that Scott's doing because he's beating you at that right now. I think he needs to go for it. Really go for it. Be a bit brave. Be a bit controversial. Um, people need to be inspired. Under a Labor government, no one will run out of barbecue sauce. Wow, OK, you're right. You feel like, I mean, those So if he can prove to me that he can do things better for our country, better than Scott Morrison, even if I don't really know him, at least that would make me feel more confident. He's the man. I've known this fella for how long? 30 years. Show more decisiveness. Show strength. Speak strongly. Speak for the people. No, that's great. Thanks for having us. There you go, mate. Good. Here we go. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that'll do. Lead from the front. Show some teeth. Come up with some really firm policies and give us all some hope. Thanks very much. I want you to be a leader. I want you to impress upon me why I should elect you and your party to lead this country into the future. Yeah.